Fifteen years ago, screenwriters Ted Elliott and Terry Rossio contributed to the screenplay for a big Hollywood swashbuckler set in the Old West. At that screenplay's four was the relationship between an old master with a deeply personal connection to a long-ago injustice and the incompetent but brave man who can make vengeance possible by learning the ways of vigilante justice by standing for the oppressed while riding his trusty steed behind a black mask. That screenplay became the well-received, fondly remembered Antonio Banderas vehicle, The Mask of Zorro. A film that clearly adored its source material. Those old radio serials and black and white television episodes about a masked man bringing justice to the chaotic and corrupt West. But the film also wanted to bring a touch of that Raiders of the Lost Ark spirit to the proceedings, allowing some tongue-in-cheek humor, humanizing fallibility, and modern Hollywood pacing to spice up all that old-fashioned daring do. Zorro isn't perfect, but it's entertaining as hell. Sexy, that sword fight in the barn yet old-fashioned, melodramatic, yet briskly paced, able to laugh at itself, but also respectful of the suffering of its minority characters. Some of that can be attributed to the incredible stunt work and a great cast and score, but a lot of that credit goes to Rossi and Elliot. These two men, who also co-wrote the Pirates films, as well as the first Shrek, have cornered the market on putting fresh, cheeky spins on old dying genres. The pirate film, the fairy tale, and yes, the masked vigilante film. People seem to forget that when Zorro came out, masked vigilantism wasn't exactly burning up the big screen. The same year that Zorro was released, Batman and Robin seemingly killed the prospects of the superhero film for decades to come. Zorro started all of that. Perhaps in tribute, 15 years later, Elliot and Rossio have co-written pretty much the exact same film. They've just pulled in a different pulp hero. In the intervening years, I think it's safe to say they've lost some of their touch. I went into The Lone Ranger having read a lot of criticism of the film that lamented its tone, its length, and its poor quality. That's not good, but like all of you, bad criticism isn't a deal breaker for me. My bad criticism probably will not stop you from going to see this film if you want to, and that's fine. I also hated the trailers. Still, not a good sign, but the trailers did tell me one thing. I knew there was a chance that with this team and this approach, hip to be square take on dying genre, I might get something akin to The Mask of Zorro. And I was right. The Lone Ranger is exactly like The Mask of Zorro. If The Mask of Zorro were made with utter contempt for the genre in which the original pulp stories were told. And if Johnny Depp kept running across the screen in face paint, ruining the remotely condonable parts of the movie. The Lone Ranger is a deeply offensive film. And the offense has very little to do with racism, though that has been a much-discussed facet of the beating it's taken. I won't argue with any Native American, or any human, who finds something wrong with this film's take on the most prominent Native American character, who is not also a sexy werewolf, that Hollywood has seen in decades. Though, I think it's fair to grant Rossio and Elliot this. Their film does a fair job of showing that this Tonto guy feeding his dead crow and nattering on about a spirit horse and broken English isn't crazy and colorful because he's Native American, but because he's a tragically broken man. Though the Lone Ranger, in one of its few salient points, argues the two may be one and the same. That's one potentially good thing you can say about the approach here. It subverts and humorizes genocide in the most insane, unkosher ways, but it doesn't sugarcoat what should be more offensive, not just to Native Americans, but to everyone who likes movies and humanity and justice for underrepresented minorities, is that the most prominent Native American character in decades has to be promoted to the world in a film that is this astoundingly bad. And, to add insult to injury, that character isn't the noble center of an otherwise messy movie, no. The agent of chaos, the catalyst that causes the beaker to explode, the worm at the center of the apple, is Tonto himself. Now, just as all the credit for the success of Zorro and Shrek and the first two Pirates films can't go solely to Rossio and Elliot, the abject failure of the last two Pirates films, critically, and especially the Lone Ranger, in every conceivable way, can't be blamed solely on the guys with the typewriters. Along the way, Rossio and Elliot have added director Gore Verbinski and movie star Johnny Depp to their posse. Or, more accurately, Rossio and Elliot have been conscripted into Depp's outlaw gang as unwitting accomplices. Depp begged to make this film a reality, begged to have the representational Native American issues placed upon his shoulders, begged to retell the old myth with a new twist. And with the captain goes his ship. Depp made this film possible, and he makes its ruin a certainty. Based on all this, would you believe I liked and admired the first half hour of this film? Would you believe that 
before Tonto and Silver team up to bring John Reed back from the dead, bringing with them the sozzled, off-kilter spirit of Captain Jack Sparrow without any of the fun, mystery, or adventure that character surprised us with, I was enjoying the introduction of this cast of careworn western tropes. What I was seeing was a deeply square movie, but in the way that the Mummy films are square, but also kind of cool. The film had a referential respect for the history of the western genre and an emotional narrative told with care and diligence. What broke my heart was the film knows it's playing it mostly straight at this point, finding its center of gravity in the stoic Texas Ranger played by James Badge Dale. It consciously wants to be a classic western up to this point so that when the classic western hero dies and gets his heart eaten, the classic western will die with him. From its ashes rising a revisionist comedy with the kooky Indian sidekick as the secret protagonist, and the ranger's sissy brother as the stooge in a mask. There is a conscious decision to make a good old-fashioned western, and then, in order to send a message, to just stop doing that. And a bad buddy comedy and a cowboy hat ensues. These two guys make with the banter, telling a whorehouse madam they'll have to shut her down because of health code violations. A magic horse prances in a tree after an entire tribe of Comanche is massacred, and Tonto, fresh off mourning his people, not days, but seconds later, gets a punchline. A bad punchline. The Lone Ranger gets his head dragged through a pile of horse excrement. That about sums up how this movie feels about the narrative of the traditional Western hero. And look, the trope deserves some criticism, of course. That trope is tied to the oppression of an entire repressed and disenfranchised minority, in the same way that so many pieces of pop culture ephemera from our past, and admit it, our present, are. It's not the message that I abhor, it's the approach. Depp's take on empowering the Native American in the Western narrative features all the balletic grace of a hippo in a tutu, and not the hippo from Fantasia, a real hippo. The main mantra of this film is, wrong brother. The film even retrofits the definition of Kimasabi to mean wrong brother. And this credo is repeated over and over again throughout the film. It shouldn't have been you, John Reed, everyone seems to say, disappointed that the shrieking lawyer is riding around meeting out justice. It should have been your brother. By the end of the film, of course, everyone tells John it's okay, he did just fine. But it's not true. Wrong brother couldn't be a truer way of expressing what makes this the worst film of the year so far. Based on 20 minutes of this film alone, I will watch James Badgedale as the trusty sheriff in every western from here to eternity if given the opportunity. Hey, Hollywood, make, make that happen. It's not that Army Hammer is insufficient filling his shoes. The film doesn't even try to make the argument he even comes close. This is, at its heart, a film about the square white man needing to unlearn his selfish, massacring whiteness. Badgedale, who in his very short but effective time on the screen, makes the hero, not the anti-hero, but the hero, seem relevant again, could never have fit into the film's agenda. And that's a pity. <laughs> the film seems to think so too. Depp's Tonto makes it clear that he wants so desperately to see what James Badgedale's character would have done behind the mask that it becomes a self-fulfilling wish. Even if we're not thinking about it consciously, we kind of do too. It's one of the few times where the main character in a film doesn't want to be watching this version of his story any more than you do. 